This is a radio broadcast from the Good Boys Gone Bland. Seek shelter now. Hello and welcome to Good Boys Gone Bland, Season 7, Episode 5, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. I'm your co-host, Denali. Everything, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> I'm your co-host, Ryan. I'm your co-host. Oh, I didn't get a filler. Beta Jace. Oh, from the Betaverse. <laughs> from the, yeah. Where? So what, what traits do you have then, uh, Jace, for, from the Betaverse? Um, normal ones. <laughs> I, yeah, I feel yeah. like I just um, decided, I don't know, maybe to sleep in for 30 minutes earlier today. Okay. Yeah. So, like, if you're in like a restaurant and something's wrong with your meal, like, would you like, you know, maybe say something or? Ooh. You, you think? D- um. It depends. If I got brought a different meal and it yeah. looked good, I'd eat it and I'd tell them it's okay. Yeah, and that kind of makes you an alpha, Jace. You know. But if they brought me like, you know, it looks like they took the steak out back, ran it over, and then boiled mm. it. Yeah. I, well, no, I probably wouldn't say anything. I probably just wouldn't eat it. <laughs> yeah. I- <laughs> i'd make yuri say something <laughs> i think no matter what they could hand me a literal plate of shit and i would yeah eat it. I, I can't do it a, i mean they're just doing yeah. their jobs the person who brought it to me didn't cook it no yeah 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 and i i cannot have any level of confrontation or any level of social uncomfortability like it's just i cannot tolerate that isn't there like um speaking of alphas and betas isn't there like a like a toxic internet thing with like sigma like i've been seeing that floating around like isn't that a thing or yeah andrew tate got arrested so i hopefully we have a little less of that (laughs) was that the guy who came up with it i have no clue i don't follow all this i think so yeah yeah guys if you know what we're talking about please seek help get therapy Mm -hmm. um just maybe do some reading Um, well like like i know about it do i need to get therapy or if i I subscribe to it (laughs) if you were like if you were like ingrained and we're like yeah i'll tell you what's up here's what happened (laughs) this is what betas do uh yeah so this is episode five we're halfway through the bunker okay that's pretty impressive can i say it's been moving pretty quick it has we've been waiting this apocalypse out in our apocalypse bunker um and i think rations are pretty good we haven't really gotten into the shittier rations like the Um, the bad mres so like are we um yeah we kind of have the benefit of knowing when the apocalypse is gonna end right the season right. are there any movies that use that use I'm, it, I'm use like an the, actual the purge it's like purge you know i'd say 10 cloverfield lane is like a bunker movie right yeah but i i think jason's asking a different question is there a movie where the characters are aware that the end of the world scenario is temporary mm-hmm. oh like they have to wait it out fallout style yeah oh that's interesting um man i mean that boy that doesn't really add like a lot of tension that doesn't make right? much sense like because <laughs> they're like oh well don't worry guys this will be over in a week i mean i guess the purge i think you know, in I would... a way um dr strange love because they had to make a decision by a certain time. They had a timer. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. whatever the decision was going to be after that, like that, there was nothing to change. So in a way, they they could influence the outcome, like whether or not there was going to be an apocalypse. But yeah. Okay. Well, um, I don't think we have a lot of options. I think <laughs> uh, watching The Purge, though, as a marathon, because there's quite a bit, aren't they? Aren't there? Like there's... No clue. That's not my cup of tea. I think yes. there are multiple. I think they've gotten into... Fast like and the 10. Furious spinoff style. Yeah. <laughs> That's also like a really good, like in relating to what we were talking about earlier, like test to see if someone's like a fucking psycho is if you start talking to them about the purge and they're like, no, it like makes sense though. Cause everyone has this desire to just fucking murder everybody. <laughs> it's like, do you though? Like, uh, cause I, I definitely don't like, there's more than just laws stopping me from like burying a shovel in like <laughs> someone's head like that's what the there's a large um kind of religious section of the country who believes that if you don't have the same moral code as them then the only thing stopping you from committing any sort of sin is the law so there that is right. kind of on brand for a lot of people that is scary right because like suddenly yeah. oh if there were no laws then all these atheists would be killing people <laughs> Thank God I have the Lord holding me back from 
Isn't that worse? Dude, Hold me back, like, Jesus. Hold me back. They don't have the oh. internal stuff. They only have external things making them not, like, skin people alive. It's like you don't have that within. Like, you know. I just wouldn't do it. But, yeah, it's like, how do they think, like, cavemen just existed? Right. Like, do you think we actually were just constantly hitting each other with rocks? Like, I don't know. I think, I think maybe- there was an alpha, beta, sigma. Oh, yeah. Hierarchy. There was a Sigma caveman Within who. The uh... caveman. <laughs> Wait, is Sigma good or bad? I don't know. I, don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I think I think the people that are calling themselves Sigmas are like a but uh, uh, I think it's like a, a different version of being an, being an alpha. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I think. I think. Doesn't make I any sense. Google either. It's, it's, okay. Well, don't, that's gonna, fine. Don't Google yeah. it. It's, I'm gonna <laughs> Google Sigma male definition and oh, just yeah, see. Yeah, that's what, okay. That they so can we not put this on the in the actual episode <laughs> i don't want to be giving them too much attention ryan <laughs> some of these insane far-right commentators are constantly rewarded in the podcast me- format i'm just saying maybe we can just drop some of these words and the algorithm will pick it up and maybe we'll, we'll boost oh you want to get uh, piggyback off of the wave no bad press. Just piggyback off the wave. <laughs> no, there's bad press. This is, I don't want to be associated is, with those people. And we're I don't not wanna... associating ourselves. We're just saying these words for the algorithm to pick up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, we... <laughs> Let's take a hard transition. Please. Please. Uh, cut back. Yeah. Jesus Christ. We need to cut like half of that, guys. Uh, don't listen to Sigma stuff, guys. It's a stupid ideology. Um, so what are we, how are we feeling? Vibe check about look watching all these apocalypse movies. I feel great. I feel like... I, this is something I might do on my own time. Yeah, like with Same, the yeah. with the holiday horror stuff. I, I I really like all those movies, and I don't know. It's it's so varied. There's a lot of diverse selection here, like this movie we have right now, and it's refreshing each week to not just have bland milk toast in front of us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I agree, because um, we're not just watching disaster movies. We're kind of watching like a huge variance, like you said of different scenarios and i think it's fun it's like a fun marathon um, which i think is against the spirit of our podcast yeah because um, we need to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> no i think it's good i think it's great i'm digging the bunker and i'm excited to see where it takes us and i wonder if we're gonna it's gonna change our mentalities by the end you know i think we've gotten a little something at the end of each season maybe at the end of this you know we'll be like preppers or something yeah, we're learning. Yeah, we're learning. And then this movie mm-hmm. taught us a, a very specific apocalypse scenario, too. The which everything is, which bagel. is Everything Bagels. Depends we on need to put out a disclaimer for this one, too. This is a popular movie. Yeah. And this one is worthwhile. Like, Moonfall doesn't matter. Watch the episode without yeah, seeing fuck the movie. Moonfall. Yeah, <laughs> who gives a shit? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, you should probably watch the movie. And let's be real clear. The movie's better than whatever product we're going to put out. <laughs> this movie, yeah. Please see it. We're just... I mean, we're going to put a spoiler warning, I think, we, we have to, because, like, I feel like this movie benefits from a cold watch. Yes. Like, I, I was as cold as possible. Yeah. So if you haven't seen this movie yet and you want to, um, just maybe hit the pause button or let this episode play out with the mute on. That way we still get the listens and it helps us out. Uh, but then come back and listen to our discussion so it feels like, you know, we're in the room with you. And if you're this far in on Spotify... By now, you can rate the podcast. So just pause the yes. movie, pause the podcast, watch the movie, mm-hmm. and hit five stars somewhere, somewhere yeah, in there. Can, can, can I also make a, make a suggestion? Mm-hmm. Can we do like maybe 10 or 15 seconds worth of commentary as if the three of us are sitting in a room watching the movie? And that way oh. someone can play the episode while they're watching the movie and they can just play that section over. And they'll feel, oh, like, I see. They feel like they're watching the movie with the three of us. Okay, okay. So we'll we'll mm-hmm. act like we're watching the beginning of the movie, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Ready and go. Oh, I didn't know she was in it. Oh, cool. That's kind of weird with the the mirror. I like I like when they do opening credits. I do that. Yeah, I, I do too. What's that song? <laughs> <laughs> All right, and I think that was good. I think that was it was about fifteen seconds. So, folks, if you want, if you want, we You're we did sync that. We synced that to the beginning of the movie, and, um, and that was now live. you guys can can have a GBGB experience. And if you guys want more of that, just let us know, and we're hoping to kind of do a more live commentary in the future. So uh, <laughs> this movie, uh, I wanted to kind of do a little activity, if it's okay with you guys. <gasps> An activity? 
it's a simple activity. It's not a game. Like we, I feel like we play a lot of games. I'm, I, you know, I, I'm worried that I'm pitting you guys against each other. Jace, go ahead. Mm. This is our, mm, this is our first yes. recording of 2023, guys. Congratulations. Oh. That's wild. That's kind of a big That's pivot. Right. It is to, to um, going into a game, but uh, we've. Uh, yeah, never mind. Fuck it. <laughs> no, it's the it is the beginning of the year for us. Cause uh, I mean, this when this comes out, it'll be a couple weeks from now. But for us, it's it's the beginning of January. Maybe we should talk about like wh- where we're at with our resolutions from last year. Yeah. Do you guys remember what you Failed. publicly said? Oh, like yeah, 2022s. I don't. I don't remember what I publicly said. Yeah, I feel like I did pretty good. I liked 2022. I was in a good headspace for the majority of it. Um, yeah, pretty healthy. I kept my health. Got COVID in January. Pretty much mm. uphill from there. <laughs> so yeah this year my goal is movie related actually nice i've been trying to watch 100 movies in a year for the last few years and i haven't made it yet Ooh! so i want to make it to 100 i think this year i was at like 80 something um, i feel like hmm. this podcast helps you get at least halfway there definitely the yeah about with, half yeah. my movies are ours which is <laughs> cool but yeah so I, I i watch maybe one or two a week you know and i so i need to average about two a week and one on the weekend, one during the week, that's fine. But uh, I've got a watch list of a lot of old movies I, I need to watch. So hmm. Sweet. Going to get that Criterion collection yeah. going. No, the... seriously. <laughs> There's yeah. a lot of old classics, I feel like. I, uh, yeah. For I think it will help our podcast when we're watching other movies as well. We can put the movies we are watching into context a little bit better. I only watch these movies. I I pretty much do too. <laughs> and it's it's so hard because so much of our movies on this podcast just because we like to like entertain ourselves and our audience are so bad that like it's I'm like eating hog shit over here for the most of the movies that I'm watching. We all watched then, uh Knives Out, right? The we watched Knives Out. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's true. Yeah. That was a great movie. Yeah. Um, maybe we'll do an episode on it if we do a related season someday. Um my I would resolution. love a murder mystery season. Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> could be. Stay to the podcast. Pitch it. My resolution last year, I believe I said I would learn to juggle in 2022. I did not. I was tr- like, Amber heard about this last week and tried to get me to juggle. Like, Amber's actually like a really good juggler. It's like kind of crazy. Huh, huh. Um, and she was like teaching me. And I kind of got like halfway there. Like I was juggling with one hand. Um, but I, I did not get it through the buzzer. It wasn't good enough. So this year, I think... I'm going to switch it up. I, I'm going to do a non-physical resolution. I'm going to make it easier for me. I'm going to lower the bar here. I'm going to, I've been kind of slacking on reading. I think I'm going to try to read like 36 books this year. That was kind of my highest amount of books I've read in a year uh, in the That's past. I haven't gotten, yeah, it, it, I had to work hard for it. Um, three books a month, uh, but I'm going to try to do that this year. I want to at least match that. I only read like a dozen. Some are on audiobooks, which is not cheating. Uh, but I'd like to be more well read, so I'm gonna aim for 36 books this year. I'm gonna see if I can get it. Uh, Jace, what do you? What, how are you? How are you doing on your resolutions? I don't remember what they were. Yeah, we could listen back. Uh, we remember could, yours from two <laughs> years ago? They yeah. they might have been like mm, they uh, were they weight. I probably related? wanted to get stronger, right? And I absolutely did not do that. Um, but I played more frisbee. I made a lot more friends with oh. my team from trout and um so i think overall 2022 for me was was a it was a good year and in the new yeah. year i probably said i wanted to dunk like i yeah, do every year you said you wanted to dunk and That's, you wanted to yeah, <laughs> yeah think, deadlift um, 500 or something uh d- 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 i did deadlift 500 pounds but did you do that in 2021 i don't remember when i did it um it might have been 550 or something like that it might have been like a we, really we got to hold each other accountable by saying it on the hot mic yeah, yeah. So, uh, 2023, 20, I didn't come up with any, and nothing's hitting the. Uh, Just, you got a resolution for yourself. I want to go Just surfing. Go surfing. Dude, yeah. Be like Keanu from Point Break. It looks fucking sick. I want to be like Keanu. I'm most likely right. going to be in Cabo for like a week. Brag. This year. Well, not yeah. really brag because I'm being kind of dragged along. But oh. the. So, yeah, we could go. We could do a GBGB's meetup. And learn how to surf. Oh, we're gonna learn to surf? Huh. I'll start watching YouTube videos Guys, tonight. Okay, so I think that's something that the three of us need to think about. Okay. Is the three okay. of us have not been in the same location since we started this thing. 
That's true. That's very true, yeah. We should try to do something this year. And mm. I haven't been to L.A. since I was a child, and it was just going to Disneyland in Anaheim. Yeah, it's not L.A. Right. Yeah. And I was a child, so it doesn't matter anyways. That's really fucking far from L.A., Ryan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it took two hours to get to Chase. So I yeah. think... I would love that. So maybe we can plan a trip to the San Gabriels or something. That would be tight. We can do a GBGB's meetup, but also mine sweet content from the presence of our three physical bodies. Uh, we can book a live show, you know? Maybe this July. Maybe this July we'll book a live show. <laughs> Did you fucking imagine a group of people that have <laughs> never listened to us before for some reason being in a room listening to us watch a movie? I would be, I don't think that I can provide much of anything during watching a movie. And between you two needing to pause it Listen. every 12 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> I drink a lot of water. Uh. Right? It'd be like, it's important. We gotta watch it again. I do that. And it would make sense. It would make sense because it's important upon watching a movie. But I think we would get drug out of the building and okay. beat. Um. Maybe so. Podcast resolution, do a live show, <laughs> a GBGB's meetup, and then um, at least get crack the top 10 in streams on Spotify or something. Maybe we need to say more Sigma male content. And just, just you know, in the spirit of the movie, like uh, like we were saying, uh, you know, this movie is about, we'll get into the plot, but it's about alternate universes and about how our, our, like, ch our choices can cause branches into two different realities. So with, with that said, you know, I figured a, a fun little icebreaker game to kind of help us get our juices flowing in 2023. Yeah, the icebreaker uh, for people who have known with, each other for 15 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, for something. Yeah, but but just, this is just, listen, Ryan, okay, this is for synergy within our podcast. Mm -hmm. This is uh, woulduratherrcom right? It's from eitheror.com. <gasps> and uh i'm gonna just kind of run us through these scenarios and and maybe we can we can kind of uh figure out like what our our universes are our alternate universes are that doesn't make any sense if you we're gonna play would you rather one, can you leave space on either side for editing yeah absolutely who writes it's like clever bot stuff like yeah the people writing these are edgy 13 year olds yeah i literally think an ai writes these all right i'm gonna i'm gonna fire up a would you rather question okay First question, and this is, you guys can, we can all answer this. Would, <laughs> would you rather uh, lose your genitalia or lose your dominant hand? And this is titled, No Hands Job. <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this has over one, one million votes. <clears throat> this has one million votes. It's obviously the lose your dominant, dominant hand. hand. <laughs> or lose your genitalia. Yeah, I guess you have another full. hand. <laughs> like, isn't that, would you laugh, rather That's lose one of use. two things? I, I I wouldn't be happy with either scenario, but yeah, I guess I guess I agree that that sucks. Some the top comment is you would still lose your hand either way. I'm not sure what that means, but it got a lot of upvotes. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna say I'm gonna click dominant hand. Uh, Sixty-seven percent agrees. That's six hundred eighty-nine thousand people. Who I, I also hmm. enjoy the implication. Uh, the person yeah. who wrote this question is male. Right. Yeah. That's, you know, it's a lot of like dude bros, I think, who are who are mm. writing this shit. It's just like chop off. Is the chop, right. Chop. Yeah. <laughs> as if it's another appendage. Do you want to play okay. a game? Yeah. There's a knife and a shovel. What's the shovel? What's the shovel? The, the knife if... cuts the hand off. The shovel gets rid of the genitalia. Couldn't you use the knife for that? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What if you were in uh what if you were in Saw and like you just pretended you couldn't hear him the whole time? <laughs> what? <laughs> Your voice is all muffled. I can't hear you through the PA. Can you turn the volume up? <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. Uh there's a knife under What? <laughs> there's like, what a you... life in here? <laughs> you just made fun of him the whole time. Okay. The next one. This is called Breakfast of Champions. This has over a million votes. Would you rather eat moldy toast, parentheses, one slice, or Eat moldy grapes, parentheses, a small bunch. Oh, God. You won't get sick from either, but both are pretty much covered in mold completely, dot, dot, dot. Um, I think I would eat moldy toast. Grapes. Um, because I heard moldy bread could have LSD in it. And oh, sick. that <laughs> could be free drugs. And kids never give up that opportunity to get high for free. You know, disclaimer, when, when, don't. When you guys were a kid... <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. I think we talked about this before, but like, did your parents ever be like, if someone ever offers you drugs, say no. I mean, I had a dare t-shirt, so. Right. Don't but like, that's sick. Where, I, I thought that if I was going to be in line drugs. at McDonald's and I felt if I wasn't right next to my parents, somebody would yeah. come by and give me drugs. Yeah. They're like, do you want some cocaine? That's, hey, that's were super... either of you guys with us when we went to McDonald's <laughs> in Fairbanks? In the middle of winter, and we were in there with a bunch of construction guys, and one of them started going off on us about how the Earth was 6,000 years old. So unprompted, huh? No, I don't think that was me. I don't believe I was there. I was with Michael. Did he offer you drugs? or Did, did he? That's, yeah. No, did that he? was as close as I've gotten. Sir, unsolicited advice and information yeah. about your worldview is not the same things as free drugs. So please, <laughs> step away from yeah, me. Yeah, he was like 20 <laughs> years old, and he was oh like, my God. hey, guys. Wait, what's up? Did you know that they, they just found proof that, like, dinosaurs aren't real and that, like, the Earth is only 6,000 years old? Yeah, dude. It's totally crazy. That's grounds to get maced in the face if you lived in a city. <laughs> like, it just, the... Well, also the implication Any... that, like, the information is coming from this guy, you know? Yeah. Like, he is it's the harbinger. New York Times membership, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> He's educated. And, like, some of my relatives on the crazy side... Sorry, Julie. Uh, they, uh, one time there was breaking <laughs> news about a conspiracy in town. Like this terrible thing that these Democrats and the, the liberals, oh, in other boy. words, I'm not going to say on this podcast, we're doing. Sigma males. We'll get more, we'll get more views, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> these people, they're, they're things with children. They're doing. And like, okay. Yeah. The, Giving them drugs? <laughs> The source was the guy who stocked groceries at Fred Meyer. Oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> like, that's the news-breaking source. As if some guy... The story's just... not related to Fred Meyer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's like, that's like the way news spreads in, like, 1960, where some guy runs into, like, Town Square. You guys, the polio is cured! Like, it's... Yeah. There's... <laughs> as if... And, like, he's not or... spreading it to... He's not, like, calling newspapers. He's just calling... He's just telling every other person who wants to buy yams. <laughs> um, uh, bread. Bread. I ate a, eat a moldy bread. grape, and I think if the whole thing was covered in it, yeah. I, w- uh, I think I could I could get down the... Sw- is it Wait, is it one grape or multiple grapes? Um, it says, eat moldy grapes a small bunch. Bread. Bread. Well, you know, guys, I don't know if you know anything about uh, fermentation or biology, but... Neither. I heard if you let grapes get old, you get a little thing called alcohol and um you can get drunk for free so well, keep bread. that in mind so uh really you this is said a, bread yeah well i like to get twisted uh versus getting crunk so um and, and kids don't don't accept drugs from strangers don't do that also don't listen to this podcast if you're a kid don't or listen to this podcast accept drugs from strangers and just buy like a testing kit buy a test kit oh, that's, yeah. Amazon. No, that's the yeah, scientific buy, method buy for patch. yeah having a yeah. great time yeah Test your molly. Um, <laughs> eat moldy toast. Sixty three percent agreed. Huh. Okay. Um, okay. Here's the, here's the easy one. Can you this read one the second ha- option first this time? The second option first. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering, like, uh, as as we continue to go da- down through this, is the first right. option the primarily chosen option? Like, because I um, like get no. a shock. Like, oh my okay. god, okay. my. Yeah. So, uh, all right. This is another one. It's called Top Heavy. This has 1.1 million answers. Whoa. I'll do the second one first. Would you rather always have a bowl cut or have a massive head compared to your body? <laughs> I have um. had, I have had both of these at the same yeah. time. <laughs> Sorry, <to know. laughs> This is a you just laugh to the face. <laughs> I wish Michael was here for this. Yeah, that would be hilarious. <laughs> He's probably be like, I want the bowl cut. <laughs> I know what it's like to have a massive head. I can't buy hats. Like most hats that I'm gifted um, don't fit me. Like, yeah, but you don't look like you have a massive head. It's mostly I, hair. I know. It's your hair, it's, dude. It's Well, yeah, I've had short hair and I've still struggled to wear any hats at all. Really? No, um, I'm saying like your hair make, doesn't make your head look big. Well, that's good. Yeah, I've, I've been able to disguise it. Like, some people can't really disguise it. Um, and I've had a bowl cut before. So, I know yeah, the I've pain had my of bowl both cuts. sides. I've had my, you know, let's be real. I grew up in the 90s. That's fine. No, I mean, like, I've had an actual one, like, where my mom put a bowl on my yeah. head and sniffed mm-hmm. my hair. Like, uh, yeah. So, okay, what, what would you guys do? Bowl um, cut. Give me that bowl cut. I'd run that shit. Yeah, bring it back. I'd make a bring TikTok account. 
<laughs> and everything. And I'd be like, yeah, it'd be fine. If you're wearing it you know in this year, let's let's say this. If okay. you're wearing a bowl cut in mm-hmm. 2023, more power to you, bud. Yeah, you're cool. Yeah. You're cool. <laughs> it's come back around. It's like it's mullets around. for Republicans now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> G- yeah. The GBGB's seal of fashion approval bowl cuts are back. Um, I'm not going to give up my big Jimmy Neutron build, so I'm going to say massive head. Okay, so it looks like most people said uh, bull cut, 700,000 people, okay? Someone said, uh, then you'd be like Ian from Smosh, smiley face. Wow. And this was a comment from 10 years ago. <laughs> okay, this is a tough one, guys. I'm only going to do a couple of these. I don't think we should take up too much time. But, you know, we're, we're branching out. We're no, creating I, new universes. It's relevant to the, yeah, it's relevant to the mm-hmm. episode. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, this is called, If You Had to Eat Bugs, Would You Rather Eat 100 Ants or 50 Beetles? What? <laughs> How is that even? I don't know if one is better or worse than the other. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, give, me, give them to me. I, I want, I'll eat them. Uh, I guess, the... like, the size variation between beetles is gigantic, right? I'll eat 100 like, ants. There's some big-ass ants, too. We're talking, like, quarter-sized ants. My dude, have you seen a Hercules beetle? It's the size of my forearm. Yeah, you might be less likely to be tricked if you pick the ants. Okay, yeah. I, You know, it's like, I'm thinking like um, Costco's New Groove. Uh, is that the name of the movie? Costco's Cos- New Groove? <laughs> Costco? Cusco's, Cusco's? Emperor's, Emperor's, New Emperor's New Groove. Are you from another universe? universe? <laughs> Good, yeah. Yeah. Um, they they eat a really big beetle. No, they eat a roly okay. poly. Mm. Like imagine like a a soup dish okay. sized beetle being brought out to, and they're like, yeah, yeah. here's one. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay. I'm I'm coming back around on the beetles because like let me posit this. Have you guys seen Lion King when they're eating those delicious bugs? Some of those some of those beetles looked pretty good. Uh, is this do you think I can have this? So in Mexico okay. City, we went right. to a tasting menu, and mm. they did feed us a dish. That had ant larva and ant in it. Oh, okay. So, a- tasty. Good. Yeah. I mean, I found worms in my rice before. That's gross. I'm what not going to throw out fuck? a $2 bag of rice. <laughs> <laughs> I have eaten, um, like, a silkworm larva before, like in Korea. Hmm. They, they give them in, like, like bags of popcorn-looking things on the side of the street. And those are kind of beetle-like. They're dead? They're alive. Yeah. Oh, they're dead. They are. They're super dead. I'm going to say beetles. Fuck it. You guys, Ryan, you about the ants? Yeah. Jace, your ants? Ant life. Beetle. Ant life. Um. Well, guys, 82% say ants. And you guys are a bunch of cowards. There's a lot of open-endedness I don't get, with that question. Yeah, I don't want to get monkey's pod. It's like I'm either yeah. cutting my balls or my hand off with the ant right. and beetle <laughs> thing. Like, give me a picture. Yeah. <laughs> like, if, if I have to eat 100 ants that are the same size as a beetle versus 50 beetles, I'm screwed. Yeah. I got you. Um, the next one, would you rather have squirrels for hands or guinea pigs for feet? Uh, squirrels and, for um, hands, because I don't want to step on fucking guinea pigs everywhere I go. Well, if they're your feet, they might be able to handle it. Um, okay, here's the here's Ooh. the caveat. They don't need feeding and are a part of you. Just accept it. That's what it says on the notes. Okay, uh, the guinea pigs, do I walk by them walking their feet? <laughs> or do I have to still step? I'm going to say that they can be normal guinea pigs while they're your feet, so you can use them to walk. So I could I could be standing straight up <laughs> with my hands like yes. at my side, not moving my legs at all, and the guinea pigs would be like... <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah you could, clear you guinea pigs. Yeah. Okay, um, but I'm also thinking about squirrels for hands, because squirrels also have hands themselves and, and feet. feet. Yeah. So are is that going to be more dexterous than hands? No... Do they like think... each other? Like, what if you're sleeping and you went like okay. this? Oh, and they don't and they like hate each other. Ah! I think I think yeah, the guinea fight. pig thing is a better, like, bar trick. Okay. I think I like guinea pigs, too. I'm going to pick guinea pigs. And 57%, 385,000 people uh, agree with guinea pigs. See, I'm not going to a bar, I think, with guinea pig feet. Yeah. I'm not going to a bar and drinking with guinea pig feet. Like, I went to a bar in Pennsylvania yeah. that had wooden floors in the bar for some reason. And no just traction. piss-soaked wood floor under a urinal. <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing that with guinea pig feet. You mean if you had <laughs> guinea pigs for feet, you would never yeah. go to a public bar? I just, I don't know. What are my options? I'd probably make a lot of adjustments, I think. Would I give them like a onesie? Like I'm not wearing shoes anymore? I, I think I'd, I'd dress them, and I think I'd give them like two little bowls so they can drink with me. 
Guinea um, pigs are pretty hot on IG right now. Yeah, they're, they're, we they're to, pretty yeah, hot. We items. need to consider the outfit angle. Mm-hmm. We need to consider like if they're sentient. Yeah, who's doing and the, the most pu- damage? The publicity uh, for our podcast. If one of us had guinea pigs, like feet. legit, yeah, yeah, and I think they make less noise than squirrels. We'd probably instantly go into the top ten animal appendage podcasts out there. I. Th- <laughs> I think so. So a lot, a lot of a lot of pros there. Okay, I'm gonna have us do one more. Okay, mm-hmm. just one more. Would you rather? I had to click through a couple of these because some of them were quite bad. Uh, but this is the next one that is not quite as bad. Uh, which wait, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, would you rather be able to pop all of your pimples at once, or be able to crack all of your joints at once? Uh, note purely for the satisfaction, of course, there's no pain, only gain. Then wait, what? Why would you want to pop pimples? And also, I don't really, I have like one pimple at a time now. Yeah, yeah I, this is definitely like a, like a teenager. A, a fort, yeah. From a, from a teenage uh, person. Yeah, I mean, some some adults have like adult acne. Yeah, it's, I mean, that's quite, fine. But like, you know, it, why, like popping them is not a net benefit. Anyways, they said it's only for satisfaction. A course. lot of people like popping. It's a yeah, whole but subreddit. You do popping that. is huge. Yeah. Um. Okay. What if you were covered in them and it was like a superpower, like you were able to shoot them all out of your body in every direction? Oh. Like, yeah. Is Puss Man like in the Deli Dudes? Or is it like they t- the Puss Man like Doctor Pimple Popper? Yeah. He's definitely not in the hero faction. Yeah. <laughs> he is definitely in the like. He's like he's trying to ruin the health code. He like tries to dudes. sneak in, and his pimple juice Chaotic. tastes like mayonnaise. So if you don't check, oh Jesus, you oh know, God, then oh. you put you put that on the sandwich, and it gives his victims uh, pimples. Oh, that's not bad. That's bad. That's very bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, crack all of your joints at once. I mean, if it do feel good when you crack your back, oh, pretty I love good. It. But when you do a big crack, sometimes people are like, ew. But if you cracked every joint, I feel like that would create a sound that's like 100 Oosh. decibels. That actually like, would be a like cool bang, day. Dude. Like, like pop. like We call him Crab feel... Shack. I yeah, don't know why. Because he's popping. It's you know, snapping, Craig's. You know how yeah. to, like, to crack, you have to like pull kind of or like or like yeah. squeeze down? Yeah. Does Do they all pop without moving or do you have to go like, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he has to do some kind of weird like fold. Like he, he turns into like a singularity for a second. Um, I mean, he just makes a loud noise with his bones. And I don't know how good of a power that is, but if someone's queasy, they'd probably faint. If they if they saw that. It, it distract people for a second. Be like, whoa, whoa. Like, oh, Jesus. That sounded like it was pretty oh. good. But could you imagine the pleasure? Like, okay. The pleasure scale for cracking your knuckles. Probably like, you know, one. I'd say a score of one. That feels uh-huh. pretty good. Cracking your back, maybe like a like a three, but cracking every joint in your entire body. I feel like there aren't that's, that many other joints. <laughs> like, there's a ton of joints in your body, dog. You got like a shitload of vertebrae. You got hips. You got shoulders. It's elbows. between every single bone, right? Yeah, all and the there are all like the two hundred something bones. Well, let's see. So I can pop two. I can pop two joints on each of my fingers. Mm-hmm. I can pop one joint on each of my toes. No, but it's all your joints. I can pop one ankle. I can pop, mm. I can pop both my knees. I can pop both my shoulders. And I okay. can do a pretty good job of popping my spine and my neck. Okay. So I'm, all, I'm like it, three quarters a... of the way there. <laughs> An inventory. <laughs> it's just like if you could do it all at once, it would probably be like this huge orgasmic experience, probably breaking the scale of pleasure uh, in an instant. I disagree. You'd, you'd feel so relieved, man. Hellraiser wouldn't be coming down from the ceiling and like... <laughs> taking you down to hell because you <laughs> popped all your joints pain and pleasure is one i'm, I'm picking the joint popping yeah i don't really see a reason why you would uh why i would pick the the pimple popping i would like to ask what happens if i have guinea pig for feet and oh, less power the, <laughs> i think the guinea pigs get popped too but they, it would they would like it like it would mm. it would feel relieving to them he said oh no pain only gain okay Plus, if you if you had the pimples, every like you know, there's a mess. The guinea pigs would get wet. Um, I I clicked the option for joints all at once. It only got forty three percent of the votes. Most people said pop all your. Pimples yeah, most at once. people are weird because they think like, oh, that would make my problems go away. Yeah, that's um, and I think these are all like very obviously, uh, you know, teenagers. Yeah, it's great that we have a lot of teenager faced content. That's terrific. Yeah, like the top comment was um. 
I'd pick pimples because I'd be able to gross out everyone at my school. Heh heh heh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, fucking fair, dude. <laughs> you have another to have... guy said, "I want another gross party trick, so I pick pimples." What is his first gross party trick? Yeah. Now we need to call you that dude. You can't just say that. Yeah, I mean. Um, okay. Okay. Person. Wait. Wait. Can, can what yeah. is a no gross problem. party trick? A gross party trick, dude. Everyone has a gross party trick that they can do. They could, you know, they someone who has a double joint. Mm -hmm. I, my elbow bends like a little farther backwards than the other one. Okay. So I, broke I it mean, once. so in the context of this person thinks that popping all their pimples simultaneously is a gross yeah. party trick. I don't think your elbow bending a few extra degrees is I, really gross. I have captivated many crowds. I have a weird growth inside my nose. Oh. Is that a party trick or is that like a... People say, cool, when I tell them about it. Well, that was would you rather, guys. Uh... <laughs> we just created... Yeah. We created a bunch 24 of alternate realities. alternate realities? A24 alternate realities and so that was fun guys if you have a would you rather question you want us to do actually i should just ask our instagram followers they always give us so much good content uh next time rather than having these 14 year olds <laughs> make these questions for us because <laughs> i don't know how much of that we could keep <laughs> hopefully not much because we are 50 minutes into this episode oh wow oh no oh no yeah um okay hey new Let's year get new me new year three hour podcast episodes <laughs> hell yeah um Maybe we should maybe we should just say what the podcast is. Jace, why, why don't you tell the audience like what our podcast does, and then maybe get into the synopsis. Hello and welcome to the Good Boys Gone Plan. <laughs> For those of you who skipped the first third, <laughs> welcome back. Did you imagine somebody landing perfectly on that and being like, "What the fuck? What the fuck just happened?" <laughs> um, we are a movie marathon podcast. Currently, we're marathoning End of the World doomsday-esque movies uh we watch 10 of them we regurgitate our thoughts <coughs> and um that could cause somebody to throw up <laughs> yeah i imagine they're wearing Someone earbuds like a... <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, if it's and, uh, guttural enough you think it'll <laughs> make someone vomit in a gym <laughs> um and we we uh we rate the movies based on how good we are that how good we think they are as a just as a movie and then yes. based on a loose criteria about the theme. Yeah. 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 How Apocalypse was the how movie. Apocalypse. And we watched everything everywhere all at once. Yeah, we're, we're just saying it with a lot of enthusiasm. We watched. <laughs> <laughs> I just ran out of air. It was, it was so long. I just, I ran out of air. Uh, yeah. What, what's this, what's this movie about? You know, everything everywhere. Yeah. All at once is one of a relatively new movie 2022 so we're released a freshie, last year guys a, f a double freshy too um I, as in it's well received and similar to pitching the fifth element which is you know we're, we're bordering <laughs> on apocalypse um on every, a technicality it's <laughs> i don't know what the cleanest way to synopsize this is uh everything everywhere all at once is the story of a uh, Chinese immigrant family, um, their relationships with each other, and a multiverse, uh, wherein the uh, the mother, played by Michelle Yeoh, Yeo? yeah, Michelle yeah. Yeo? played by Michelle Yeoh, causes the near collapse of the multiverse by, I guess, estranging her daughter, played by Stephanie Su. Su? Shu. Shu? Shu? I think Stephanie Shu, yeah. Yeah, I, I would I would say that that's you know that's kind of the the loose premise. It does get a little crazy, and this movie kind of unfolds, and you kind of figure out the rules. Yeah, I think you know, we should just talk about. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. About, uh... Going the premise route for this is better because like the whole idea is the whole movie is a, is a premise and how it plays out. It's not like yeah, this person goes to this location and finds out mm -hmm. this new information. Yeah, and I kind of the, the central thing is that they have this thing called a reverse jumping technology um, that allows them to access the uh, the knowledge and partial consciousness of themselves from other universes. And uh, this is yeah. this is kind of done to to deal with an alternate universe version of Michelle Yeoh's daughter who has become the evil Jobu Tupaki and uh, who has set name. out. Yeah, it's <laughs> and, and she is amazing in this movie, um, but she is set out to. 
supposedly destroy the universe uh, with the invention of this uh, black hole everything bagel. And there's there's a lot of hijinks along the way, isn't a there? A lot of hijinks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I did not expect it to be a comedy. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it was a, it wasn't a straight comedy, and I appreciated that, but it was definitely like really sincere and. That's something that I think has been missing in a lot of, I don't know, blockbuster comedies recently. It's like everything's always got this wise crack, like, oh, sarcastic character off to the side who's making light of the situation. Think about Guardians yeah. of the Galaxy. Like in a lot of ways, it is sincere because there's a personal journey behind it. But then everything is a joke. And like there's always some there's a character who's a raccoon and you're like, ha oh, funny raccoon, you know, breaking <laughs> the tension. Whereas well, in this, the <laughs> the comedy was so interwoven the raccoon with, yeah the there is another raccoon, raccoon. yeah <laughs> and uh i i don't know i i was really surprised at how well the, the comedy was interwoven with the drama and i felt like i could laugh at the jokes and mm-hmm. I, I i didn't feel like it was at anybody's expense and that's a huge huge like plus for me for comedies nowadays because a lot of the comedies in the 2000s and the early 2010s were like you know punching down mm-hmm Boy, don't we know it, watching so many of those. (laughs) Yeah, and I totally agree, Ryan, about your your comment about playing the comedy straight, about doing it sincerely. And, you know, there's been comments about the kind of Marvel-type comedy where I think a lot of this stuff, like when, for example, Michelle Yeoh's character sees, you know, Rakakui in in, in this movie or sees something obscure, if it was Marvel, she'd be like, seriously, guys? Seriously? You know, there'd be kind of this quippiness um, where you're kind of in on... You're, you're supposedly in on the joke, but just playing it, leaning into it harder, I think is a breath of fresh air in this yeah. scenario. And you have to be careful with a movie that has its comedy based on randomness because there there was an early internet, not early internet, but like, you know, juvenile internet mm-hmm. phase where everything on the internet was just random. There's a classic. Holds up spork. Yeah, th- exactly. There's a classic. Yeah internet cartoon or at least a parody of one that kind of pops that balloon for a lot of people and this movie didn't have any of that i was really surprised by the everything bagel joke and Mm -hmm. it didn't feel random like that is really clever you know it's not just like oh the black hole is actually a bagel (laughs) my favorite bagels are everything bagels no it's like could you imagine if everything was on a bagel like (laughs) literally everything and yeah. using that as a premise is so much funnier than using it as a punchline. And I, I totally agree. It, yeah. it, it, it really caught me by surprise. I didn't know this, that was going to happen at all. And a lot of the times I felt really interested in the movie and I wasn't so much watching it for the podcast. I, I was just blown away. Yeah, I, I think I texted you guys too, where after I finished the movie, I was like, guys, I took no notes. Yeah. Like I, <laughs> I was like, I, I got five minutes in and I was like, I can't, I can't take, there's no way. I could split my brain like this, and I just I was in I was in for the ride, and I'm gl- I'm glad I did it because I feel like it would have hurt my experience trying to take notes. I would miss so much. Um, Mind you, too, that this is a I think two hour and ten minute movie that is split yeah, that's insane. up is split up into three parts, everything, everywhere, and all at once. Not all the equal length, but it's almost like shocking how how drawn in. Like so, I've seen this twice now. And uh, watching it with a fresh set of eyes is, I'd, I'd recommend it. I'd recommend a rewatch. Um, but getting to the point where you're like, you've been watching this movie for an hour and a half, and then we're in, in uh, a second dimension, and Michelle Yeoh is an actress, and the mm-hmm. movie in that dimension ends, and it's like, directed by. And it's like, I think both times, I even got, got by it this time, I was like, that's the that's the end of the movie. Mm. They're gonna end it on that cliffhanger. Yeah, yeah. and then and then it zooms out, and then you're actually in the movie theater with them, and you're like, oh my god! And then you've got like a whole <laughs> another hour left of yeah. of development and interaction. Yeah, that Julie was said. Well, amazing. so I said, uh, you know, that's not actually the end of the movie because I looked over and she was like, oh. <laughs> she's like, what you think? Like totally, she got got and. I don't know them being able to do meta jokes about that, about the fact that they're in a movie and also notice that the movie in the movie was this movie and directed by the director of this movie. So just those little in jokes, I think is totally fine. This movie didn't take itself seriously at all, but yet somehow was sincere. And I don't know how you do that as a writer. This is something that just 
something goes into a black box and out comes this movie and i have no idea how to get into that black box as you know someone who would like to be a writer and it's really awe-inspiring when that happens because you just it's fun to see people who are good at what they're doing do something that you like watching and Mm -hmm. a lot of the time when we're watching moonfall and all these other movies, I'm just like, eh, kind of, this kind of sucks. Like, the people who do this are just getting a paycheck. But right. for this to be kind of a passion project, or at least feel like a passion project for a lot of these people, I don't know, made me feel 100% okay with enjoying it. And that's, sometimes I feel guilty for enjoying movies, and I don't feel like that this time. Yeah, this was not a guilty pleasure. And, and what you said, Ryan, about, you know, having a movie that was so silly and, like, kind of joyously goofy, yet also really sincere... Um, like I, I got that too. And it made me dig up like a, a quote from a book from this year called uh, bliss montage. Um, it's by Ling Ma. It's really good. If you guys like this type of stuff, it's, she's a, also like a Chinese American and she kind of talks about these, she has these surrealist stories, um, you know, spread throughout this collection of books. And one of the quotes in there that I kind of had to dig up for this was, uh, you know, it is in the most surreal situations that a person feels the most present, the closest to reality. And she kind of uses that in her books by creating these ridiculous situations, yet you start feeling this really real emotion because of it. And I think that was a good driver in this movie. You know, maybe without all this wacky ass shit, you wouldn't be able to get through some of these really serious messages Mm -hmm. in a way that was effective, which I think is crazy. You know, like what movie does it to that extent? Um, So I thought that was super tight, like totally blown away by that. Yeah, I agree, Janelle. And a lot of the time now looking back on my life and looking back at my current lifestyle, I think about the concept of core memories. And usually (laughs) if something is super vibrant in your brain, there's some sort of of out-of-body experience you have. And you're like, whoa, this is wacky. I'm going to remember this. So now, and it's around the New Year's, I'm looking back on my life and kind of trying to identify those core memories. And yeah, this movie makes you think about that because she left home and she... Mm -hmm decided to marry this guy and decided to have a baby and all this stuff. And she looks back on those decisions, kind of like her version of core memories. And for her, every single time, they're not happy. She says, like, I made the wrong decision. And I'm fortunate enough to be able to look back at my life and see those same types of turning points, maybe not so drastic because she is an immigrant, and and, and say, I made pretty good decisions. And I think that's important for a movie to do that, to make you feel like, hey, look, your life's okay. You know, it could be, it really could be a lot worse <laughs> and not everybody's in my position. So some people don't have that experience, but yeah, that was very natural and organic for me in this movie. Yeah. And that was kind of a driver of, of the plot, wasn't it? Was that, um, the reason why the Evelyn, you know, Michelle Yeoh's character was chosen was that she was the worst version of herself <laughs> in every multiverse. She was the one who endured all of the worst timelines. Um, and therefore she had the greatest potential, uh, to defeat the great evil, which I thought was both hilarious, um, because he was that line where he's like, you're so bad, you're actually good. <laughs> um, but then it also ties into, I think, you know, the wider narrative of generational trauma. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, you know, it relates to the types of pressures that Asian Americans can put on themselves. You know, you look at how her dad, Gong Gong, is like talking about his own daughter, where it's like, you fucking suck, you're the worst, you're out of the family. And there's a lot of a lot of times where you can feel like the worst version of yourself. I even know just, you know, just watching this movie, I saw so much of, you know, what my mom told me about her experiences coming to the U.S. for the first time. And then even my partner's family, who's, you know, strong ties to L.A. Chinatown. I mean, so much of that aspect, I felt like they represented that so well in this movie. And to have like scenes where you have like these fucking hot dog hands things and you have like this raccoon in a chef's hat. And to also tie in probably one of the most poignant stories of, you know, generational trauma, I think is, is such like a, just like a masterstroke. Um, I also wanted to kind of talk about a little bit about like the other kind of experiences that Michelle Yeoh had in here. Because Jace, you mentioned about the alienation of the daughter in this movie. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that is, you know, it's, it's kind of like, there's a tired stereotype about the cold, judgmental Asian mom but they actually do the legwork here to help you understand her perspective and feel empathy for Michelle Yeoh's reality. And like, you know, doing these like flashbacks where it's like, I'm sorry, it's a daughter. And you see all these like Mm -hmm. scenes where she's going away from home and and shit like that. I feel like that's so hard to do. And they captured it with so much care. And uh, yeah, I I felt, I felt seen in this movie, even though I don't, my immigrant or, you know, I'm a second generation, Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, you know, Asian person, but like, 
you know, I feel like a lot of people will feel seen just from experiences like that, where you feel so much empathy in just all these different directions. This is a good movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't want you to feel like you had to jump in. Yeah. But I'm, see, sometimes if I suggest a movie and you guys both connect with it, mm-hmm. uh, I like to sit back and see what you guys think about it. And so it's interesting that, you know, Jace had seen this movie before. Did now had you seen it? No, this is the first watch. Okay, so yeah, yeah. me and you hadn't seen it before. And whoop, knockout, like out of the park. Right. <laughs> and that's really cool because sometimes, you know, it d- just doesn't work and you're kind of like left defending your movie. And it's good yeah. that Jace can stay silent and be like, yeah, see, like, see what I <laughs> see what I meant. There's Dude, a, yeah, there's a, yeah. I'm, so I was going to, through that, um, one of my favorite jokes beyond them tying it to a raccoon under a, uh, a chef's hat, the raccoon thing. Um, Yuri's dad immigrated to the U.S. when he was 16. And I think that in part of them hitting the jokes and us feeling like things were funny is her saying, no, raccoon raccoon And the daughter's yeah. like, are you saying ratatouille? <laughs> and just being like, in the, and then uh, Wayman, uh, played by Ki Hui Kwan, Wayman Wang, yeah. Uh, yeah. was just like, Ratatouille, I love that movie. And she's like, no, <laughs> raccoon with the raccoon. And you you kind of, um, they leave it open-ended in introducing yeah. raccoon in A, a slip of the tongue from, you know, the characters right. are established at this point as speaking English, but their English is a second language. And then you're, you're then shown that this time, this verse jumping technology fractures the brain. So anytime she's slingshotting through <laughs> the multiverse, she might have actually already seen Rakakuni. So she was literally <laughs> like, no, Rakakuni, the red, the raccoon. <laughs> Dude, the Rakakuni reveal, the like payoff. I was like crying. <laughs> like, yeah, was that so was funny. one of the funniest like <laughs> single scenes or like punchlines. I've seen in a long time and I really like that the buildup was verbal and the payoff yeah. was visual and yeah. <laughs> you don't get that all the time. And that's really good script writing and really good storytelling when you feel like this little mini story is happening. And then at the end of the movie, like I cared about this little raccoon, like this, <laughs> that's the third step in a, in a joke. Mm-hmm. You have the buildup and the setup and in this movie that's so complex, you can set up multiple threats and none of us know which ones are important. Yeah. And then when one of them pays off, we're like, oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> and then we keep following that story throughout the rest of the movie because the payoff isn't at the end. You know, in, in a different type of movie, that would have been like a kind of deus ex mach in a way for, to save the day. But mm-hmm. in this, the payoff is in the middle and that joke keeps getting deeper and deeper and it doesn't become a joke anymore it becomes like a character and an influence yeah. on the outcome of the movie to show her character growth she doesn't mm. despise rakakuni anymore she wants to help him <laughs> and that's just yeah. the most sincere form of joke telling where like the person that we're making fun of is not the butt of the joke it's a it's someone with feelings and goals and needs to pay the bills and when your main character, who is kind of the audience corollary for a lot of this, is initially hard on this person and then comes around, it's important that the audience feel that way too, so that you don't start alienating yourself from the main character. And a lot of movies don't take that into consideration when they're writing the story arcs or the character arcs. And I felt like, I don't know, I, I, there's something about this movie that I could never attempt to repl- replicate or, you know, I don't even, I don't know how they did it. It's really, really well done. Yeah, totally. I mean, kind of what you're saying about like, you know, radical empathy is a theme in this movie and it's used as like an antidote to like some of the nihilistic themes in here too, where it's like, oh, nothing fucking matters. And Wayman's speech about kindness and love and caring about others was kind of used as an antidote to that. And, you know, you feel so much empathy for every character in this movie. Every character I feel like is fleshed out um, and you, you kind of get an understanding. And I think that's like so brilliant too. And to kind of build off on like the payoff with the gags, like I loved how 
every character needs to do like an improbable thing to access another universe. Yeah. Like biting the chapstick, like, you know, doing something crazy. And then it builds to a fight to shove something up their ass in, a, <laughs> in this moment to access the farthest, most martial arts oriented universe. And then you get this brilliant fight between Michelle Yeoh and two guys with trophies up their asses. And that was just like chef's kiss. Like the, the action scenes in this movie are phenomenal. They're so good. They're spectacular. <laughs> it's like an insane. It's like if the first time I watched this, it's like I felt the same way the first time I watched um, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. It's just like, oh, fuck what yeah. The fuck? <laughs> no, I was going to mention Kung Fu Hustle as being oh, a Kung really Hustle, good yeah. analogy for this movie yeah. in that like the story really blew me away. <laughs> it's Kung Fu Hustle. <laughs> but you watch it and a lot of the times it's like a scary movie type parody of these kung fu movies and then it ends up being really good yeah and this movie is also you know a celebration of that genre but also a celebration of michelle Yeoh. Mm -hmm. this is kind of considered her magnum opus my queen michelle Yeoh won person of the year this year and then had this killer movie and i like how they have like one of her alternate universe selves is kind of like herself in our universe mm -hmm. you know she's a successful movie star who's a martial artist um, and they, then like this, yeah, they did that with Waymond as well. Cause in mm -hmm. that universe, he was a, a director, I believe. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and he was, uh, he was a child actor too, wasn't he? In, yeah. He was Indiana in Jones the Goonies. And, and the Goonies. Yeah. And that dude did his own stunts too, man. The fucking, like <laughs> I read his, uh, his AMA about the fanny pack scene where he uses that as like a rope dart. And he's like, yeah, I did the stunts for that. I'm trained in the rope dart. Yeah. And uh, I was able to do all of that myself. And wow. I was like, holy shit, that. that is so sick. The, <laughs> You're trained in the rope dart? like <laughs> That scene, like it was the first combat scene in the movie, really. Yeah. And it's important that the audience knows what's happening, too. Because that scene evolves, right? Mm -hmm. It starts out pretty basic. Okay, there's a confrontation with one character knowing Kung Fu, and the other guy's not taking it very seriously. The security guy's not taking it very seriously. And, oh, it kicks some ass. And then everybody gets back up, and the fight starts over again. And you have mm -hmm. to take care for that to not get repetitive. And so what the, the character did was once again stop and, like, upgrade. <laughs> he, like, went over right. to the fish tank and, <laughs> the like, fish, the rocks pulled, the his, back, pulled his sleeve down ahead of time. And yeah. for, for the, the movie to be using that as, like, Oh, what is he doing now? Because he just ate chapstick last time. Yeah. And I don't know. There's, there's a lot of visual cues where if you just rely on actors or characters speaking lines and saying like, oh, you want to do this again? Well, then I'm going to have to get stronger. Right. Like, uh, <laughs> it kind of falls flat. And this was a movie. And I, I like that about my movies. I want them to be movies. I don't want them to be like documentaries or books. Yeah. No, I totally and you know Michelle Yeoh and and Kehui Kwan like they really delivered in that regard they're able to like emote with their bodies but also just like you know bring a lot to these characters um i also wanted to like give a shout out to the Stephanie Stephanie Shu um who played Joy in this movie i feel like she didn't like she was she was the only one who didn't get a golden globe nom um which... i think Jamie Lee Jamie Lee Curtis got one which she did a great job but like i feel like Stephanie did, did so good as uh, Jibu Tabaki like that opening scene where she has the pig and rolls up and then just takes down all the guards and does this really big performance, but then goes back to a grounded performance as the daughter. Um, I thought was, was amazing. It's really hard to act like that in these movies. It's, it's probably extremely awkward to just be doing all these weird hand signals and talking like this and doing all these speeches that are really big while fans are blowing and shit. I thought she brought a lot to that too. And, uh, justice for Stephanie Shu. Give her a fucking Oscar nom. Agreed. No. Yeah, and she's responsible for making the big tonal shift. Yeah. You know, because like, even up till then, we had some kung fu scenes, we had some verse jumping, but it wasn't mm -hmm. silly, really, until she yeah. showed up. And I, I appreciated that because you have to really nail that scene or else the rest mm -hmm. of the movie, we're not going to buy in. And like, that scene was the moment where like, okay, I'm going to put my notebook down. <laughs> like, <laughs> I got to watch this movie because this, like... There's no really verbal jokes in the next like five minutes. It's all visual. And mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just, it was really a blast of color on the screen. And I think she did a good job. I didn't really love her performance in the entire movie, but I think that physically she kept it up mm -hmm. with the two old professional actors. Yeah. Like, I think she had the most demanding role. I, 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 I mm -hmm. yeah. So, Cause, and, yeah. I think Michelle Yeoh could 
kind of lean on the straight character a little bit not lean on but like that's you know she a lot of times was like stoic and kind of processing internally whereas the other character had to switch from being like one person in the normal world to being a silly character a lot more often so Mm -hmm. yeah yeah it was a treat to see michelle yo kind of play in the space a bit she had funny lines where the guy's like, are you going to get up? Or are you going to like fucking come with me? She's like, I'm just going to lay here. And then, or like that line where he explains like what's going to happen if the, if she doesn't help them. And she's like, I'm too fucking busy. Like, come, don't leave me alone. Which I just, I love that scene. I could see like my own mom saying that to someone just like, get the fuck away from me. <laughs> like, I don't have time for this. But yeah, this was like such a, yeah, such a treat. Like we've been seeing so many, like I didn't realize how much it's mentally affecting me, but like how many bad pieces of cinema art I've seen in, in a like lot. just a, in like a two year period compressed. Even though we had good movies in between, it's just so compressed in my brain that I was like a shit eating sea slug, and then I just had a burger dropped on me. Like I was just nearly convulsing with excitement within the first five minutes because I was like, "Oh my god, it's a good movie!" Like, "Oh, these dire- this directing," and like, "Oh my god." So I think that's also why we're just like. I feel like we're over the moon right now because we haven't, I mean, we don't get a lot. We don't get a lot of good movies in this podcast (laughs) because we like to marathon. Yeah. And we don't get a lot of movies that are, that like reference other movies too. This, this was a very meta movie Uh and it was very obviously kind of a swan song like to this Mm -hmm. person's career, but at the same time was standing on the shoulders of giants for, it made several references to movies that, and well, besides Ratatouille, but like that had things that this movie was taking ideas from. Hot dog monkey hands. <laughs> yeah, right. With 2001. Yeah. yeah. I loved how the monkey with the normal hands got, <laughs> got murdered to death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that, the 2001 reference always makes me laugh. I, it doesn't matter. You can put it in anything and I will laugh. There's so many ways to reference that movie. And we saw Interstellar, which was a mm. different kind of homage. Like, it was yeah. a let's do what 2000 did kind of in the 21st century space. And this is more of, hey, look, 2001 was an extremely influential movie. What if human history had changed? Oh, how do we reference that? Oh, let's go back to one of the most influential movies of all time and show it in yeah. that context. And I thought I liked that a lot. It's a different way of saying kind of the same message. Like I, re- I appreciated that much, especially because I love that movie. But then... There's a reference to Chungking Express, which is a um, movie from a Hong Kong filmmaker um, named Wong Kar Wai. And that was a little bit more subtle. And I, I, that movie it wasn't an ex- explicit reference to that movie. It's more of that film style. He does a lot of um, two actors in the foreground in focus and the background being a blur. So when she was in the movie movie star alternate universe and having the conversation with uh, her husband the background sometimes would blur and the frame rate would slow down but the audio would stay at uh, what we're used to and that's a reference to Wong Kar Wai in his style but then Chunking Express is a movie that's has explicit parts so it's literally divided up into parts and you could obviously tell I mean this being a movie that uses a Hong Kong fighting style too uh, I think it was pretty clear. I, I just like that sort of stuff. It's kind of Easter, it's sort of Easter eggy, but it's also yeah. like, it's not like when you're playing Grand Theft Auto and you're like, oh, there's a little funny trophy over here. It's an Easter egg. It's more of like a nod to what's influential for those filmmakers. And that's to me what makes it more of a passion project than yeah. like a studio blockbuster. It's something like Marvel. Yeah, you know, I, the Daniels, the, the directors of this movie, yeah. Daniel Kwan. And I mean, Daniel, it was produced uh, by two Marvel directors, the guys who the Rus- did yeah, all the, the Infinity <laughs> War and stuff. So, But the Russos know how to bring a good fight scene yeah, into fine. a movie. I mean, I don't and, know how much uh, control they had. Yeah, the Daniels came in here definitely as fans, and uh, it, it shows in this movie. Also, I saw, like, which is kind of crazy, the visual effects team was, like, basically five six, people. Six, yeah. Yeah, like, (laughs) that's fucking crazy. And they said they just, like, taught themselves with tutorials online. I did not feel the budget of this movie. Um, You know, it's like sometimes you can tell, like, a movie is only, oh, it was like $12 million. This was $12 Um, million? Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is insane. And it made $100 million. And it's it's A24's highest grossing film they've ever done. That's uh, really surprising to me because, yeah, I mean... I was listening to like James Cameron interviews because I just saw Avatar 2, which is the highest budget movie ever. So right. that, that was back to back with this. <laughs> yeah. And uh, 
he was talking about Terminator 2 being like $80 million and the studio freaking out. And I'm like, damn, that's a good deal. <laughs> and then to see that this was only $12 million and it's kind of felt like a similar right. scale with alternate universes and end of the world and stuff. So that's interesting. I mean, they just they did clearly did more with less. Um, just to just to get into the box office real quick uh, about this movie. This movie premiered at it was at number 13 in the box office when it came out. Wow. So didn't do like extremely well. And I think just word of mouth, I think it built over time. Mm-hmm. Um, can you guys guess? <laughs> I, I'll give you a million dollars if you guess what was number one this weekend. This was uh, the weekend of July 29th, 2022. What was number one? uh this this weekend and i'll even give you a hint okay all right the movie is about pets it, 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 it had pets huge names <laughs> what? no uh rio three is there a rio three okay I don't know. i'll i'll read the cast dwayne the rock johnson kevin hart which i know doesn't doesn't narrow it down <laughs> yeah they're in every movie together uh, uh john oh, krasinski oh, b- 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 what kate is mckinnon the dogs two dogs cartoon okay, okay. Okay, I'll even say a word that is in the title. League. League of oh, Extraordinary League of Pets? Pets, yeah. yeah. <laughs> DC League of Super Pets uh, was what? number one. The iconic... We were in the summer of DC League of Super Pets, guys. Do you remember that huge uh, cultural uh, touchstone? I don't know. It made $9 million uh, opening wolf. weekend. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah, that, that's where we are, guys. And uh, a Nope was number two. That's a, I heard that's a good movie. Oh, yeah. I haven't seen it. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think it's it's safe to say like we had a, a, a you know a positive reaction overall to this movie. How did we feel about the solution of the premise? So this is the only mm. negative I can talk about with a movie. Okay. I didn't understand the plot. Like I didn't mm-hmm. understand the consequences of the action. And something for me is like having, I don't know, because like, it's going to sound really, really basic, but like. Having stakes behind a fight makes it more important. But mm-hmm. sometimes the main, the bad guy would just beat up the main character and just not kill her. And sometimes mm-hmm. the big bad MacGuffin, the everything bagel, would be sitting in the background. And I wasn't sure what it was doing. Like, why was that a bad thing? Whereas, like, in a different scene, they couldn't look at it. But on this scene, it's just kind of chilling on the stairs. And that's, I don't know, there's a lot of maybe muddy waters for me. I understand they didn't want to do a lot of dialogue. Like it wasn't supposed to be a dialogue heavy movie. And they thankfully didn't resort to like, oh, you dumb character don't know what's going on. Let me explain everything to you. It's so I, I don't know a better way of doing it, but I really did not understand the consequences of what was going on. I think they were I think I would agree with you in that it seemed like there was maybe a misunderstanding from early in the film when Alpha Waymond uh, pops in for the first time and says, look, uh, Jobu Tabaki's going to end the world. And upon hearing that your statement, thinking about the end, it didn't really seem like the end of the world was going to end, just that Jobu Tabaki was going to like kind of merge themselves with the everything bagel so that they could remove themselves from, you know, the metaversal existence. Um, I, th- yeah. I think I think Jobu Tabaki themselves was the kind of existential threat to the universe and that being all knowing and all seeing and being able to go and cause chaos anywhere was was a bigger threat necessarily than the everything bagel but it's kind of compartmentalized this movie as we know it takes part in one day it's less than 24 hours um the major threat really seems to be to jobu tabaki's family within the universe as opposed to the universe ending and really it stops being about the universe ending and about kind of starts being more about Michelle Yeoh losing her daughter. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that the movie kind of intentionally shifted towards that. Yeah, because like you said, it was a misunderstanding because Wayman at first was like, oh, she's building a device that's going to destroy the universes. Uh, but then it's kind of revealed Jobu's like, no, I built this so that uh, I could just eliminate my own existence because existing as a multiversal being is torture Mm -hmm. and then kind of her goals with michelle yo is to make her like her so that she would have someone so that she could be seen and be understood which i think plays into the wider theme right of the division between the daughter irl or in in our universe Mm -hmm. not connecting with her mom and then you know and then i think she's trying to get her mom to also destroy herself (laughs) too Mm -hmm. and then the mom pulls her out but yeah i agree that like it was i think a little obtuse 
Like maybe there there could have been an extra line or two um, to kind of make it like a little more a little more obvious. Yeah, just uh, like oh, all the multiverses will collapse if you know she goes yeah. in and everything bagel, everything will get sucked in. It doesn't have quite everything yet; it only has half the universes or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think because yeah, I don't what ultimate this this might not even like go into my my move or my my apocalymeter. Like because I agree, I don't think the universe the universe was was ever at risk in this movie because it's it seemed like the the bagel was just for herself yeah instead of it, for the universe well it seemed to me like it started out as kind of a hubris thing like a i can i've you you broke me now i am everywhere all at once and i have this power i created the everything bagel because i could and now it also happens to be the one thing that'll stop me and i i think honestly in in that regard i thought it was really beautiful at the end that um it's like yeah we're gonna have to deal with being everywhere all at once but if we ground ourselves in this reality and we've fixed what happened with our we and we've we've come to terms with what happened with our family what was wrong with it then you know we can be together and yeah i think it's really emotional at the end i think this is probably yeah. one of the movies that had the biggest emotional impact on me because of that in 2022 yeah, I agree. It's hard to have such an emotional scene. Like I've never cried at two rocks before, um, but like that definitely happened here. <laughs> yeah. I, so I hate to be the downer. Oh God, this, you guys were so sincere about that. Sincere is kind of the name of the or the word of the day. But mm. I didn't. I, I understood the characters. I think you know. I I mean, I walked away from the movie thinking that, and I just didn't have a lot of emotional connection to my personal life and what they were going through. Although I like understood that it was important for those characters and I cared about those characters at the end of the movie, my or at least halfway through the movie, my um, takeaway was more like, oh, your life is fine. You're not the worst Ryan. <laughs> like, you know, I'm doing OK. Uh, yeah. So my takeaway was more like I didn't have an emotional connection with it. I couldn't see me in that position. And halfway through the movie, I thought about the question I always ask you guys about could the GBGB survive or could we solve this situation? And I kind of thought, well, by definition, I would never be put in that situation. So yeah, I, I, I didn't think this movie was that emotional for me personally, but then Julie said it, she cried like three times. And so last night I was like, oh, was it emotional? I kind of didn't realize that. And I didn't think that you guys would be super emotionally impacted by it. Maybe you're a psychopath, right? Yeah. Maybe I'm a yeah. psychopath. No, I cry a lot. No, it's, uh, yeah, it's no, not it's that like, I don't have no, uh, yeah. sympathy. I think um, personally, like, could you imagine yourself as a father one day and accidentally imparting these kind of emotions into your child? Yeah, that's And, fair. you know, having to... So it, I, th I think the... Um, we talked about empathy earlier and, like understanding where even Waymond is coming from where he's like listen we don't interact unless it's like a business thing or you know you need me to do something and he, the first third of the movie is really weighed down by the fact that he has these divorce papers and mm -hmm. it's just like breaks he's like listen i they even switch universes to where instead of going to the janitor's closet they were leaving to just go home it's like the closest universe we have at this point where he's yeah. like, I just wanted to talk. I needed to do this to force you to talk. And I think almost everything that related to the family when we were grounded in uh, in the universe was just like, it hit home to what a lot of people feel like between the family and themselves and familial expectations that it was. Okay. You no, know, that's, yeah. that's, I, yeah, I didn't feel that. I liked those scenes. Mm -hmm. Those were my favorite scenes of the movie. And Wayman, his speech when he was like, um, in the movie, the famous movie person universe, when he said, in a different universe, I would like to just do laundry and taxes with you. Like, that was oh, really, yeah. that, that was impactful great. for me. That was my favorite line of the movie. I, I really liked Wayman's presence in this movie and, and seeing Wayman, you know, kind of say that line where it's like, this is how I fight with kindness and with understanding. Like, that that really hit for me. And I, I really liked that aspect of the movie. And it and kind of created that healing moment uh, for Michelle Yeoh's character and I thought that was tight. I think everyone needs a Wayman in their life. I try to be that person for, I really do, for a lot of my friends who go through tough stuff. Mm -hmm. They know, always know they can talk to me about it. And I really try not to compare or one up because <laughs> let's be real, like I'm fine. <laughs> so I try to just understand where they're going from and or coming from and see like if it's helpful at all to make me understand and try to care about them 
And even though I can't like do anything to help them, uh, I, I, I had that realization in the last, you know, five years or so that I just want to be a genuine person. And when you're having a, if you're sitting alone with a, maybe slightly better than acquaintance, but with a, with a friend and it's just the two of you, sometimes just say, Hey man, how's it going? Like, how you doing? What's going on? Are you, are you doing all right? Cause it's nice to just have someone take the initiative and check in on you. If sometimes if someone I hadn't talked to in maybe a month or two and just texted me and be like, what's going on, dude? Like, how are you doing? Mm-hmm. How are you, how are you mentally? It would mean a lot to me. And I feel like I could maybe dole out on them a lot more stuff than I would be able to dole out on somebody that I talk to every day because I wouldn't feel like I was weighing that person down. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's also nice, like, to just have someone to vent to or to be listened to, too. You know, I think that was like a, a lesson that I had to learn, too, where it was like you, some people just don't need their problem solved by you, where if they vent, vent a problem and you're like, oh, well, you just do fucking do this and you'll be fine. And they're like, well, that wasn't like the reason why I was <laughs> talking to you. <laughs> yeah. And like, I, I totally relate to that. And I feel like this movie, you know, this is an overstatement, but I feel like it, it was... Uh, you know, a therapy experience, like years of therapy compressed <laughs> into two years, um, you know, explaining all these different, you know, social conditions. Um, but I mean, do you guys want to get into your meters and uh, and talk about? Yeah. I want to talk about something before yeah. we get into the meters, just because, oh, um, I mean, it'll go into the score. I think like uh, scene setting and just visually the movie, obviously beautiful. Uh, one of my f- um noticed on the second rewatch that um jamie lee curtis as the kind of irs agent you get a pretty early indication that she's going to be related to jobu tabaki with the severe circling of the tax documents oh shit um, the de- i didn't get realize the, that you get yeah. the dark circle uh but then the fact that the googly eye is the exact opposite of the dark circle yeah. Which I didn't pick up on until this time. So like the the dark circle, the everything bagel is dark with the hole through it, and the googly eye is the white circle with the with the dark hole through it. So it's like a yin and yang type of yeah. thing. Oh, I thought that was like a third eye reference. I think it's it could be both. Interesting. Yeah. That's, no, that's, that's really like clever. That's really awakening clever. and. Yeah, I had to read that, Jace, in the uh, Wikipedia. <laughs> but let's, that's that's how that's you picked up on it yourself. Um, I didn't pick up till the two, t- the It end. took two watchings. I yeah. didn't pick up to the end the fact that the circle she made on the paper and stapled to her head was the symbol for the bagel. I didn't pick up on that till yeah. way later. Yeah, this movie had so much good, like, little jokes or just, like, little references like that, which is nuts, man. Probably took a long-ass time to write. Should we do... Is it... Oh, okay. Is it apocalimeter? Is it apocalometer? Apocalometer. Apocalometer. How apocalypse was this movie? Uh, Am I who first? starts? Ryan. Ryan. Yeah, Ryan. What do you think? This is a toughie. This let's let's be real clear. So this is not our movie meter. This yeah. is just how end of the world e was it. Um, and true. Once again, part of my rating is coming to the fact that like the end of the world didn't happen in this movie. Whereas something like 12 Monkeys, it had already happened and they were trying to per, like go back to kind of ameliorate the mm-hmm. effects. Moonfall half happened. And this movie was them trying to stop it. So it was nice that they were related to the end of the universe. But the first knock is that didn't happen. The second knock is I'm not really sure what the consequence would have been. Like, mm-hmm. as soon as you tell me that there are multiple universes... If the end of the world does not impact them all, then I'm going to feel like the stakes have not been raised because I'd be like, oh, in fact, the stakes are lessened. Like, that's kind of a relief that there's other universes out there. And if there would have been more of an interplay between the everything bagel and the other multiverses, I think I would have been a little bit more scared and scared for the characters, too. This is a toughie because it does count. I, I really think it does count as an end of the world movie. And... Once again, I went in cold, so I didn't know uh, anything but that. And I think I'm going to have to go with like a three. It it sucks to be tough on this movie because I loved it. It's one of my favorite, well, it's the favorite movie I've seen this year. But like, (laughs) 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 Uh, but no, seriously, it's one of my favorite movies I've seen in a long time. And yeah, it sucks, but I got to be tough on it. But it wasn't trying to (laughs) be a 10 on our apocalometer. It was trying to be a 10 on our movie meter. So yeah, no, three is fine, I think. Mm-hmm. All right. A three on the apocalometer. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm going to have to agree. Like, I feel like we, we are all kind of feeling the same way with this movie because um, ultimately we found out that the universe wasn't really at risk because of the the switch of what the bagel was for. Initially, it, it did seem like the universe was going to end. Um, there, Jobu Tupaki was like someone who was wiping people out in different realities. Um, but it wasn't like a central role, I think. I think a lot of this movie was about this family's journey um, and Michelle Yeoh's journey throughout the multiverse and the lessons that, you know, that you can pick up from hi- having this like nihilistic, uh, I guess, journey. Um, so for that, it's going to be a little low. I love this movie. Okay. But unfortunately, I don't think it's very big on the doomsday. I mean, we saw a movie called Moonfall, which is about the moon smashing into earth. <laughs> and I feel like that, that is like an apocalypse movie. Um, this one, for that reason, I'm going to say it's like a one. Okay, I, I do think it re- my, it registers a little bit on the scale because someone does say, oh, the universe is going to fucking end. All right. That 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 does. That is something. Uh, but ultimately, I don't think it, it, it got there, which is fine. Maybe to its benefit. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be a one for me. I would. Uh, I think that mm, uh, mid season goal for this has kind of been to choose movies that are end of the world or end of the universe. But are kind of subverting our like moonfall expectation in this. Mm. I mean, this is this movie is the prime example of that where there's the throwout line that it could end all um, end all life as we know it. And I think major props are going to go to developing a multiverse theory in the movie that's not entirely wacky or zany that isn't entirely out of, you know, our ability to understand it, um, which can happen with time travel movies ghost movies but yeah missing a lot of the key elements you know the this wasn't the u.s government's fault they didn't try to nuke it (laughs) um (laughs) no nuke (laughs) nuke the family uh (laughs) so uh but i think it was super cool like the the multiverse jumping the fact that we were referenced to a major parallel universe where that had been pretty much destroyed by jobu tabaki and they're driving around in vans with very well constructed scenes that help them slingshot from the universe there into another universe. And the goal of those techniques and reason for including them in the story was stopping what they thought would destroy the universe. Um, so I think I'm right with Ryan in that it's probably for me around a three because it didn't really end up being a multiverse apocalypse. It ended up being, I kept thinking it's like, Mom, I want an apocalypse. The mom's like, we've got an apocalypse at home. And then it's just <laughs> them fighting at home. <laughs> uh, so three on my apocalometer. All right, a three. Um, so not very high on the apocalypse meter, which is probably why we liked it so much. Uh, now <laughs> for the movie meter. <laughs> what do we actually think about this movie? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Uh, Ryan? What do you think? Yeah, I think this is the harder part because I, I it still hasn't fully baked in my brain. And I think I'm going to need a second viewing to, to see what I actually think about this movie. But I mean, this podcast is kind of a gut feeling podcast. I don't really prep all that much. <laughs> so why do it now? The aspects of this movie that I thought really paid off for me personally are the good filmmaking techniques that I enjoyed partially as an amateur movie watcher <laughs> that I like just pointing at the screen like um, Leonardo DiCaprio in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood uh, yeah. and just being like, oh, look at that thing they did. That's cool. And showing my knowledge off to uh, Julie. And so she thinks I'm a macho man. <laughs> the I thought the camera movement was always really purposeful. It, it, they did a really good job of tracking shots and not just in the fighting scenes, but in the... Uh, like when they're walking down a hallway or they're walking through an office building with cubicles, the, the camera movement knows what's going on. It, it's, it serves a purpose. The uh, focus pulls were really great. And I like that the apartment scenes were shot from a, the same camera angle every single time so that the way they directed your attention or ma- made you look at a different part of the room was by changing the focus. And that is something that's, I think, not really uh, appreciated enough from people who shoot everything in focus. Like if you have an apartment, it's sometimes it's nice to be like, okay, shoot everything really long, uh, give a large focal area so that you like, you can see this person on this side of the room and this person on this side of the room and the main character in the middle. I, I like when they tell you where to look. It, 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 it takes a little more precision. It takes a little more thought. And the one 
A uh, couple, two changes I thought that you don't see very often is a, is a focal length change in the middle of the shot so that yeah. everything was really like wide and then you go to tell a photo and that really kind of makes you think the character's having a realization or something is happening to that person's mind and they're being like drawn out of the moment. And I thought they did that really well. You don't see it all that often. You kind of see it more in stylistic movies or like um, I think... Uh, Edgar Wright does it every so often. But the one thing I've never seen done before is an aspect ratio change in the middle of a scene. Oh, Jace is doing the hand trick to... The, ha- oh, the hand trick. Sorry. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you didn't never seen the, the no, hand I've trick transition that. to the everything bagel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, the, the aspect ratio changed gradually throughout one shot. And that made us both say, whoa, on the couch. <laughs> And not that I really understand what it did for the movie because that means it was shot at the wider <laughs> or the, not yeah. the wider, the the more the more boxy aspect ratio and then just digitally cropped. So I think in the end I, I don't know why they did that, but it was cool, I guess. It was kind of just putting some paint on the car. Yeah, I, I, the the references I really did enjoy. I talked about a few before, but I really saw influence from The Matrix, which I love. It's one of my favorite movies. And Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which I think is an underappreciated movie. And a lot of the same kind of comedy about randomness and about the end of the world and nihilism comes from that as well. Where like the famous opening words of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy are like, in the beginning, uh, God created the universe or the universe was created. And it's pretty much widely accepted. That was a bad idea. And (laughs) so it's kind of the same idea. You know, I don't care what happens to the universe. There's no point. And um, when someone can operate in that space and make you care about the characters who say nothing matters i think that's really important and i liked that in some ways i like that the villain like now i said the fact that the apocalometer wasn't high is going to probably going to be good because the villain had to operate in a smaller space this villain couldn't be like uh zorg or whatever from fifth element where they're like doing all this grand stuff in space and trying to murder millions of people it was that you know she was going to kind of destroy her family and tear her family apart and that those little realistic things where you kind of think at the end of the movie there's a chance the mom is crazy and is using this all this multiverse stuff to kind of like cope with the thought that she's not close to her daughter anymore and her world might end if she loses her daughter that's a realistic type of thing that someone can go through and yeah for this movie to be able to balance the sincere with the comedy so well i thought was something i've never really seen before it's not perfect but I think I'm going to give it a nine. Yeah, so a little bit better storyboarding from the stakes aspect, and I think it could have been a pretty much perfect movie. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. All right, a nine. That's a pretty good score by any metric. Uh, yeah, Ryan. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna agree, and we've, we've been kind of glowing about this movie. I think all episodes, so we've already said a lot about what we liked about it. You know, I did kind of say that, like, I appreciated small details in here. Um, related to to being an immigrant, you know, the Asian immigrant experience about experiencing microaggressions that can happen every day, like the creepy old white dude fetishizing the mm-hmm. mom or like the IRS agent, you know, being like condescending to or suspicious towards the family and shit like that. Um, little details like that, you know, make me see that it's kind of carefully crafted, um, but it's also done with like a lot of love. One of the one of the, the scenes I really appreciated was the mom coming up to the daughter and she has a look on her face like she wants to say something really sincere or apologetic. But instead, she's like, well, you're looking fat. You need to eat better. And then just goes away. And I feel like anyone <laughs> with an Asian mom <laughs> can kind of relate to a moment like that. And a lot of that happens because of defenses that were built up because of generational trauma, because of expectations that I think is so common. Um, and I think putting something like that in a movie and making you know a wider, under, wider audience understand that I think is so helpful and I think it's it's the benefit of having more voices in movies. Um, so I think that was super tight. Um, we already talked about kind of the acting and the directing in this movie. It was so dynamic. Um, it was exciting and fun to watch. And I can't believe I saw a movie that was over two hours and I never checked the timer. Like I never saw like, oh, how much is left of this? Like I was glued to the screen the whole fucking time. I don't think there was a single moment because of how like ADD this movie was um, where I was like bored. I mean, it was one of the wildest movies I've ever seen. Like if you can make your audiences like laugh and cry sometimes in the same instant, I think you've done something really special. I think it's hard to pull something like that off. 
I mean, these are the dudes who made Swiss Army Man, which is one of the weirdest, joyously weird <laughs> movies I think I've ever seen. So I'm glad this movie exists. I think this is one of my favorite movies I've seen like in a, in a long time. Um, for that reason, it's going to be a 10 for me because I think everything for me worked about this movie. Um, I also just love seeing Michelle Yeoh and things, you know, and then also just to see James Hong who is like 94. <laughs> He's been in so many movies. Look up James Hong. You've definitely seen a movie with this dude in it. Uh, and also serving up a great role in there too. Um, yeah, I was, I was so into this. So 10 for me, man. <sighs> you look like you're big I, thinking, I Jace. Think, yeah. I think it, I think something special has occurred when a movie can have a scene where Evelyn and Joy are rocks in a universe where life never developed and only text is on the screen, but they've put so much emotion and effort into the movie, into the characters, that you can hear the text as them, that you have enough experience with these characters that the intonation in the text on the screen is being like played in their voices in your head. Um, that's how it was for me. I think that this movie did comedy and kung fu and everything just really well. I think the comedy subverted your expectation of where a scene might go, where we're introduced to Rakakuni because Evelyn needs to know how to fight, but she's not close to a universe that she can jump to where her self in that universe has Kung Fu knowledge. She is given a, a scenario that she has to do something crazy, and the closest thing she can get is a Benihana chef. <laughs> I loved I I I can't um, I'm beaming with how they did everything visually and Ryan you talked about the scene where um where Waymond is like it's this really beautifully shot I think man, hard to get my thoughts straight here I love how they were able to use the multiverse to provide different examples and different looks and really give us a sense of how these characters developed and you have Waymond, who is a movie director, and he's really sleek, and he's in this beautiful suit and these glasses, and he's the shot is focused only on him, and you can see some of like the moon or the streetlight, and he delivers that line, like in another universe, we could have been doing laundry. And it just I don't think because of the scope of what you know we're reviewing here, we've watched movies where you get to really understand and connect to characters like they were able to do for us here you know like so it's a 10 it, yeah it's a 10 movies 10 yeah, yeah. <laughs> for me i i uh everyone definitely needs to see this um yeah hot. i think it's one of the best of 2022 or if not the best like yeah it's yeah. it's it's up there for me i I did see a lot of movies that I really enjoyed. And I think that's great. We're seeing people like auteurs like James Cameron come out and people like Robert Eggers, who I absolutely love, make really serious movies. And then we're seeing people make these awesome comedies. And yeah, I don't know why anybody would have a bleak outlook about the future of movies with stuff like this coming out. I, I, I do yeah. want to talk about the rock scene real quick because like I love that scene. That's my favorite scene in the movie. But mm. because it's so simple, not not only from like a storytelling. Haha, it's funny with rocks. Like that's one of the scenes that yeah. make me think about Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, too. But the the fact that it's shot like a real conversation. So the, the filmmakers are treating the rocks as characters and the the. Part of the reason the scene works, yes, it's because the characters are authentic and believable, but also because the the camera has coverage and then it has two inserts. And we talk about this all the time, but it's not like just shooting the rocks from random angles. It's a, a nice conversation set up. It has four shots in it, I think, until the rocks start moving. And the one's coverage, one insert, another insert, and then you have a camera movement from like the upper left and to, to kind of give like a dramatic scale to the whole thing. And it's done with purpose. It's done like it doesn't break the 180 degree rule. Whereas a lot of people are like, it's just rocks. Who cares? Just throw some cameras out there. But like when a character, one of the rocks starts speaking, it switches to an insert of that rock. And yeah, I, I thought that was really, really clever. And I appreciated the way they did that. They, they put a lot of thought into every single scene, even the ones about rocks. And like, then on the other hand, you have, the main storyline takes place in one building. Mm -hmm. And you don't really realize that till the end of the movie <laughs> that like, oh, they're yeah. never going to leave this building. But like, that's 
a really kind of a risk, you know, to try and sell yeah. this movie and be like, yeah, a lot of this stuff's happening other, in other universes and like, but none of them, the locations are not fantastic. The locations are pretty mundane. And I thought that was a really nice way of keeping the scale small and believable in a movie that's about literally everything. Yeah. See this movie, guys. Uh, if you listen to this this far and still haven't seen it, you guess you should still. Yeah, big mistake. Even though we spoiled it, yeah, you should still see it. There's no way you could spoil a movie like this too. It's like there's no way we could convey. Yeah. The images, <laughs> like that came out of this too. You're gonna see uh, two people sucking on hot dog fingers with ketchup and mustard spilling down their chest, but not in the yeah. way you're thinking. Not in the way Not you're thinking, way. and it's gonna make you cry. And the you're gonna piano cry. scene, oh man, yeah. <laughs> that got to me. That was the part that I thought I was gonna cry. Yeah, yeah, and the wrist brace on the the foot, which is <laughs> yeah. so good. I also saw Mitski and David Byrne did the closing credits, who are two musical artists that I really love. They both make like fantastically weird albums, and just having them close out a movie like this, I think, was just super fitting. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's safe to say you got the GBGB seal of approval for this movie. One thing I noticed that other like other pop culture podcasts and review podcasts do um, is that they usually have like a recommend section like at the end. And I thought it might be cool if we like, you know, maybe drop some recs or like, you know, maybe talk about something that's been making us happy like they do on NPR or something like is there's something that you've seen in the past like few weeks that you're digging or do you, do you recommend anything? It could be like a hot sauce you had, or it can be a tight new show that you've been watching, or it's it could be the sweet-ass lawnmower you bought, and you're psyched about that. Hmm. You guys got anything? I mean, I think it might be nice because we're, we're pop culture icons. We're critics at this point. And um, maybe we should give something to our fans. Uh, this is... Uh... This could be funny because if somebody has a Kindle, I think the first book in the series is on sale for like 99 cents right now. Um, There is an author, Andrew Rowe. He's got uh, three series that I think are all set in the same world, but um, it's a a series called Arcane Ascension. And uh, the fourth book just came out. And it's kind of, um, if you like, it's called a lit RPG. So literary RPG. So the the style of the oh, book yes. is that it's it's set in like a role an RPG game world. So um, based around characters, you know, kind of doing things that's a, a similar to gaining XP, learning more about you know how a character would learn about magic if they were to go on a, go on and start an adventure. So I just read the fourth book. It's an interesting take on the fantasy genre, Arcane Ascension. I maybe. Maybe give it a shot if you're looking for something in the fantasy genre to read. I just added that to my Goodreads. Arcane Ascension. That sounds dope. I've never heard of uh, something like that before where they're doing like D&D things in a book. Yeah. Uh, well, sweet. there are D&D books. Right. I mean, yeah. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> there are D&D books. Which I could recommend uh, those too. Or well, yeah, just see. anything by R.A. Salvatore. Yeah. Jace is my forever DM. Oh, it's R.A. So, Salvatore? Uh, I take the rec for him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Ryan, you got a you got a wreck? You, you got know, a wreck you want? At this point, not really. Uh I'm not doing a whole lot. This was kind mm-hmm. of a chill holiday season, and I think um my wreck is just keep your expectations low. Uh yeah. i I this is the happiest <laughs> holiday season I've had in years. I think probably Yay. you know, eight years or so. But mostly because I would I never built it up in my brain and I just was like, it's I'm I'm gonna be alone. It's gonna be okay um yeah i don't know I, i'm in a good space mentally i'm not i'm not absorbing a lot of content i don't want to tell other people to go out and buy stuff i have a telescope i got a telescope for my parents for christmas it's like a little beginner telescope it was like under 100 bucks 100 percent worth it i've been able to use it like twice that shit is dope uh my expectations were super low uh, and i looked at the stars and shit man and there's like other moons around different planets that you can see with your eyeballs not like see on like a freaking nasa you know drop or something like that it's like with your own eyeballs you can prove that the earth is not the center of the universe <laughs> uh it's wild out there folks so yeah look, ryan recommends telescopes or just looking up sweet and just being a one with the universe you know yeah hell yeah i love it i love it i'm glad to hear that too ryan um yeah and i i think uh if i had to to do a rec too I, i'd recommend the book i was talking about earlier bliss montage by ling ma it's a uh, super sick one of the i think one of the coolest books that came out this year 
Um, another book I want to recommend, like last week when we were watching 12 Monkeys, we've been watching a lot of like time travel, alternate mm-hmm. reality shit, um, is Recursion by Blake Crouch. Blake Crouch is kind of like, he's written another book called Dark Matter, which I really love, which is also about alternate universes. This dude's a very much like a Michael Crichton type writer, so not big on like narrative prose, but he takes a concept and takes it in the fucking craziest direction. Um, and then usually by the end, I'm like, holy fuck, that was insane. Uh, it'll, it'll definitely be a ride. Um, so it's Recursion by Blake Crouch. Super sick. I think they're making a movie of it like in 10 years or some shit. <laughs> Um, but check it out if you like multiverse stuff. It's not like this movie, though. This movie <laughs> definitely takes it in like a more comedic direction, which I also love. You know, um, now that you mention it, I can tell you've been reading books. <laughs> you sound fucking smart and stuff. <laughs> you sound fucking smart. When, you, when you've been talking, you've been using big words that I don't understand sometimes when you describe things. And- it's because I, re- I, I do read the dictionary every day, and oh. that helps me know, know words real, really good. And I'd recommend that to everybody. Read one dictionary word every day before you go to bed. My mom used to tell me to do that, and it made me a big brain. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> next next week, um, so we have a little bit of a situation, okay? So next week, we might have a guest on, um, a guest, Michael, who hasn't been on since our dog season. He did Air Bud 5, if you ever want to check out. <laughs> he fucking hates us for it, too. <laughs> he still hasn't forgiven us. Um, he may be on next week, uh, pending like his schedule, which is totally fine. If he does show up, um, well, we're happy to have him, but uh, either way, I think I'll, I'll I'll have, have, I'll have us do this movie either way. Okay. So we, we've had a lot of ups and downs this season. Okay. You know, we had the core, which I think was a slight down. We had, uh, the fifth element, you know, which, which was controversial. I think some of us liked it, which is cool. It was Um, a down though. Moonfall. Which okay, I think we all. I think we technically agreed it was kind of a down. (laughs) Okay, all right, all right. Um, And then yeah, yeah, Moonfall was a down. This was an up. And so I think naturally, like maybe after an up, we should maybe send it straight down into the fucking toilet. So what I'm what I'm picking is Geostorm. No, Uh, this is a movie. That's another Roland Emmerich, isn't it? Uh, I was I almost picked a Roland Emmerich, but I this is Dev Dean Devlin. Okay. It's a different screenwriter. I was going to pick Day After Tomorrow, but then I was like, you know what? Let's have a little fun. The movie kind of slaps. Let's go in to, to Geostorm. This movie has a 17% of Rotten Tomatoes, and it's about weather changing satellites. What did and what Moonfall I was interested have? in, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, was, it was pretty bad. Um, Day After Tomorrow had 42%, which is crazy. But anyways, this, this movie, it's going to be a fun ride. And uh, it's about weather satellites, and I can't believe it was made in 2017. This is after the big disaster boom of 2012. Uh, so, was your 17 yeah. percent a, a tomato meter or an audience score? Moonfall had a 70 percent audience score. What? Oh <laughs> my god! Uh, 36. 36. Well, it just tells you movie. who's watching those movies. Yeah, folks, if you ever want to know why we're in this situation, just look at the audience score of some of these movies. <laughs> uh, so join us next week, maybe with, with Geostorm. Michael, if you're listening, I'm sorry. And uh, you should have saw this coming. And uh, if he's not there, though, we'll pick another movie that'll be fun to do, I guess. Hey, does Sharknado count as a... It's just L.A. <laughs> I looked Look at, at it. What's, what's up with Gerard <laughs> Butler getting in these end of the world movies? This is another one called Greenland. Greenland? A meteor hits Greenland and melts all the ice. <laughs> Jesus. Is that enough to like raise anything? I don't know how big Greenland Colorado is. I mean, it's pretty fine. big, I guess. Yeah, Colorado would be fine. Might have some beachfront property. Um, there is a movie called Volcano that I remember from the 90s, but that was also only L.A. There's a lot of like L.A. disaster movies, but well, I just, that's what the spirit of the that season tells you a lot yeah. about what they think about world I mean, ending. To be fair, yeah. the center of the universe is L.A. for a lot of those people. It's my fucking pick. Yeah. We're gonna oh, watch. I respect it. I respect. We're gonna it. watch Geo Storm. All right. Uh, did you vet it's it? It's been a while. Did I vet it? Yeah, it's on HBO Max. The first LA. piece of trivia yeah. says several <laughs> cast and crew, even extras. Noted that lead star slash producer Gerard Butler did not appear to know many of his lines. <laughs> so the old Marlon Brando technique. Line. <laughs> oh, no, that blank. Oh, look, it's the feature directorial debut of this uh, director. We'll get a directorial debut, guys. And that'll be a treat. We'll see an artistic touch we haven't seen yet. Its budget was $120 million for a f- And how much did it make in 
How much did it make in theaters? Wait, 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 wait. Uh, uh, uh. these are okay, wait, these wait, wait, wait. are day yeah. of discussion topics. This day of discussion topics. Join us next week. Thank you guys. Um, anything you guys want to sign off on? Maybe a word of advice to our audience. Bagel. Ba- ba- was that was that it? Was that you're just the bagel? I bagel. forgot what she sings before the bagel. <laughs> oh, I think it, I think this bagel. ending on bagel. <laughs>